for the Industrial Development Board here on Wednesday, October 20th. It is here right at 10.07 a.m. and it appears we do have a, have a quorum, so we will move forward with getting this meeting underway. First item uh, is the consideration of minutes from the from last month's meeting on September 15th, 2021. Uh, we did email those out, but it looks like there were potentially just a couple of minor changes, so I will give everyone a couple of minutes to review those before we, uh, and then after that I'll, I'll uh, entertain a motion to approve. All right, are there any questions or comments or changes that need to be made to the minutes as presented? All right, if not, I will entertain a motion to approve the current minutes as amended. All right, thank you. Is there a second? I'll second it. All right, thank you. Uh, motion properly seconded. Any discussion? All right, let's take the vote. All those in favor of adopting uh, these minutes as approved, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, outstanding, the minutes are adopted. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> oh, very quickly, I, I, did, I didn't want him to think that I forgot about him. I do want to, very quickly before we go on to the public comment period, uh, welcome board member Brian Cordova to the Industrial Development Board. You thought I forgot about you, huh? <laughs> uh, we, won't, we won't put you on the spot today, but uh, Brian was, uh, was approved two weeks ago at the uh, first meeting uh, in October. So uh, first of all, thank you for your, for your willingness to serve. Um, obviously, it's an extremely competitive process, so congratulations to you. And uh, you'll find, uh, as you get to know this board, you're coming out at a great time. Uh, we have some older members like myself. I guess I'm now the OG of the group. But uh, we certainly have some uh, newer members as well from, quite frankly, all, all walks of life and, and certainly different geographical areas, different backgrounds as well. So uh, welcome, and, and we look forward to working with you. And very quickly, too, I want to congratulate Vice Chair Segal as well. Uh, she was up for re uh, reappointment as well, and uh, she was also appointed and, and voted on and approved to serve another six-year term. Again, very competitive process, so congratulations to you. And congratulations to you, too. Oh, well, thank you very much. So, uh, anyway, very exciting times, and again, look forward to working with everyone. All right, let's go to public comment period. Uh, item number three on the agenda. Uh, we will now hear any public comments related to other matters on the agenda. You will have three minutes to speak. Uh, we ask that you go to the podium. Is there anyone here today wishing, in the audience, wishing to be heard? All right. As there does not appear to be anyone uh, wishing to be heard today, we'll, we will go ahead and close the public comment period. Thank you. All right, moving on to item number four, old business. 
resolution approving the authorization issuance and sale of special assessment revenue bonds for the South Nashville Central Business Improvement District, CBID, and all matters related there too. Uh, so let me, let's level set this uh, briefly. Obviously this is pertaining to the Century Farms development. We do have the developers here again today. Uh, we spent great discussion at September's meeting, getting some background on the Century Farms uh, project and all of us were here at that meeting uh, aside from uh, new, our new board member. So we'll certainly, what, what I'd like to do here is certainly give, uh, give the developers an opportunity to give everyone a quick high level overview of the Century Farms development overall. Uh, certainly give uh, board member Cordova and any other board members a chance to ask any questions. And, and let's do that first, uh, just to understand, the, make sure we're clear on the project big picture. Um, and then from there we can <coughs> talk specifically about the resolution that we are uh, moving to, uh, that we will be voting on rather uh, in today's meeting. So with that said, let me do this. Let me bring up uh, the developers, uh, Old Acre McDonald, if you all will come up, introduce yourselves. I've, I've got a couple points I certainly wanna cover, but I will, um, I'll defer to you all first. And if you will, just kind of give us a, first of all, introduce yourselves and then uh, give us a high level overview of the, uh, of the project. Again, you were here last month, so not necessarily as in greater detail, but uh, do that and then I will certainly allow our, my fellow colleagues to ask any questions. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, I'm Bill Oldacre, this is Mark McDonald. Uh, we're Oldacre McDonald, a Nashville-based commercial real estate development firm. Uh, we started buying land out in Southeast Nashville in, two, in 2015 for Century Farms, and assembled, I believe it's 11 separate parcels of land, totaling a little over 300 acres. Um, once that uh, assemblage was completed, we uh, planned the development and over the last six years, five or six years, we have been working to construct parkways throughout the property and, and, and utilities, infrastructure, just general public infrastructure, sewers, everything, uh, street lights. And at the same time, the state of Tennessee has been constructing an improved and expanded exit 60. And that exit 60 opened about a month ago, so to traffic. Uh, we now have got um, multiple parcels of our project under development. We even have two or three that are completed and opened. We have a CHS has a 250,000 square foot office building that was home to 2,000 employees pre-COVID. It's now home to something less than that and I think they're kind of coming back slowly. We've got an HCA owned freestanding emergency room there. We also have and uh, TDK from Murfreesboro has constructed a 212 unit apartment property and uh, they have a second one under construction and we also have a medical office building under construction. About a month ago, we sold a site to Nashville SC for their new training facility and corporate offices for their, their, their MLS soccer team. And, and, and Bill, real quickly on that, just to bring up, I saw that that groundbreaking just occurred since our last meeting. So that's, that's really neat. That's exactly right. And I was out there a couple of days ago and they're digging footings for their building. And, um, and we've delivered the site to them. They have three full size soccer fields, plus a building, total buildings of about 50,000 square feet. It's really beautiful. So um, we are now, uh, have also sold another site to another multifamily, um, group from, from uh, North Carolina. And we also have a, we're gonna close in about a week with an Atlanta based firm for a mixed use project of 317 residential units and 22,000 feet of retail. So, and, and, and this, we believe that Century Farms will, will build out over the next couple of years, two or three years till, till it's fully completed. 
And at the time, once it's fully completed, we think it'll have over 100 new businesses will be, be housed there. That's outstanding. So a couple, thank you for, thank you all both for, for your time today and coming again. So a couple just points that I want to just refresh everyone's memory on that I, that I thought were important based on what you said today and, and when you came before. First of all, just a geographical area for, for a point of reference. This is in the Antioch area between Bell Road and Hickory Hollow Parkway, Century Farms Development. Uh, huge, and I won't get on the whole soapbox again, but certainly I grew up in this area, so certainly understand. And one of the, the, the items that we discussed at the last meeting, I think it's important for people to think about is from a geographic standpoint, a lot of the retail left uh, as changes happen with the mall. So instead of the, so when people are shopping, they're going to really oh, two places, uh, one, they're going to Mount Juliet, some, uh, Providence, certainly, which again is Wilson County. Nothing wrong with shopping there, but certainly not Davidson County, Metro Nashville. And also certainly going to Sam Ridley, Smyrna area as well. Uh, so this is certainly an opportunity to have some development and give people an opportunity to shop and keep those property tax dollars within Metro Nashville, Davidson County. So geographically, just want to bring that up. Uh, also, this understand this was a seven year project in total. This is about 300 acres in, in size, correct? Correct. Um, obviously Nashville West is a model, but this is a lot larger <laughs> than Nashville West for, for anyone who shopped at Nashville West and I, I certainly have. Uh, for the, uh, on your end too, I think it's important to note just from an infrastructure standpoint, because we're coming up with that today, just on your end, your group spent about two and a half million dollars just on the design for the new interchange there, the diamond interchange. Um, and, and that's significant too, because it's, it's certain when you talk about even, comp even businesses are, that are not necessarily involved, like part of the Century Farms development. One of the challenges as we've discussed is Bell Road, uh, that, that intersection there, uh, when you get off the interstate, is very challenging. It's, it's always congested. So this will certainly relieve traffic from there as well, which will um, hopefully help traffic flow and help businesses and, and help residents get around. So that's really neat. Um, you talked about the medical office building. There's lots of multifamily here coming as well, which is great, but also office space too. So when we think about live, work, play, this certainly gives an opportunity to all of those in the Century Farms development. And then if you could too, because it, you know, there were some comments about small businesses. If you could talk again a little bit about the food hall and, and your plan for that, that would be great. Okay, uh, and I will say you mentioned Bell Road. We also sure. purchased, we previously purchased the, the, the vacant target that was located at Bell Road and redeveloped it. Uh, we also bought the the closed Shoney's at that same interchange, the Bell Road exit, and redeveloped sure. it. Um, but the we also are working with a local group on a food hall that would um, be a, approximately eight to ten separate restaurants in a in a in a cluster, a little small cluster of buildings uh, adjacent to one of our multifamily properties and next to a, a next to a retail center that we plan. All right, that's that's terrific. Thank you for for sharing that. Um, and, and if you could to just speak to obviously I understand and you all we talked about this, there were some questions about you all attending some of the community meetings, which I have personally attended some of those going back six, seven, eight years ago with CNAP. Um, also that's, that's something that you are very active in. If you could speak to that and also speak to, uh, you know, when this project was first getting started, there was a different council member in place, council member Dow, if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, can you speak to, you know, that transition and, and uh, you know, your current conversations and, and the, uh, your partnership with the current council person that's in place now? Sure. Uh, hi, Mark McDonald. Um, you know, before we even started this project, we had over a dozen community meetings and kind of brought the many different groups uh, of the community together to get their input as to what they thought was important to the community. So I think we tried to use, work with Councilman Dow at the time and come up with a plan that everybody liked and embraced. In fact, when we came up to the city council for 
approval of what's a very large project. There were no objectors, and there were only people speaking positive, to the point that the vice mayor said, guys, we're here to hear from the community if they have any concerns. So this is not a cheerleading session. This is a uh, session to hear about concerns. But there really weren't any. And I think that's a uh, kudos to Councilman Dow and kudos to our group for working with the community extensively. David Young, who's not here with us today, attends every community meeting that we were invited to, and I think some were not invited to, but we're at every CNAP meeting. So we really be, think we're a significant part of the community. We embrace the community, embrace, embrace the uh, diverse groups of uh, residents that live in the community. And Antioch is a very diverse place and has a very diverse group of people that live there, which is great. Um, you mentioned small businesses. I wanted to add uh, Tanger. Uh, outlet malls, which is doing a big project in the, in the center. We're, they're in town this week, and we're meeting with them and kind of moving towards the closing with them. It's made it a real commitment to try to include some significant local business activity, and I know they're reaching out to small businesses as we speak to try to get small businesses to, to be included in the Tanger Outlet Mall. They think that prevents, for, that's a very positive uh, kind of a, uh, situation. Um, so we're excited to think there'll be many more small businesses that are already Nashville-based small businesses that will be included in the, in the overall development over time. Outstanding. And, you're, and, and you mentioned this before, and I've, I've, I've obviously eaten there plenty of times, but you, to small business too, you all, re, even though this, it's not part of this project, it's certainly in the area, the Applebee's close to the mall, you all redeveloped for Slim and Huskies, correct? Which we did. I think most people, if you haven't eaten there, I don't know where you've been. Pretty good pizza. <laughs> <laughs> so. Fantastic, and, and it's doing a great business. And, and I think you, you mentioned, or I want to kind of mention the sure. impact this has on the overall Antioch and the greater Southeast Nashville community. I think Century Farms is kind of a spark that has sparked a redevelopment, an increase in values, and a kind of a, kind of a very positive feeling about the Antioch community. And we're very proud of that. You, you, you talked about Nashville West, when we did Nashville West, very much the same situation happened. That area had been beat down a little bit, downtrodden. The Walmart had closed, the food line had closed, and we saw a real resurgence in retail and property values all over the, you know, all over that kind of West Nashville part of the community. And Charlotte Pike has now obviously exploded. We think Century Farms can have much the same impact in Southeast Nashville and the greater Antioch community. And so we're excited about that. Okay. Well, well, thank you for, for sharing all that. And I can certainly speak to the good old days of Hickory Hollow Mall. I think I shared it last time. My first job was at Cinnabon and we were always busy. There were people everywhere in retail and you fast forward, you know, some 10 years later and areas totally changed. You want to go eat, very few options. Uh, not a lot of retail, for, not a lot of options for shopping as well. So it's certainly a positive overall for the community to, to have options in close proximity too. So thank you for sharing. I will uh, start over here to my right. And, and what we want to do here, these are questions just on the development for right now. Uh, obviously they were before us last month, but, and just gave us an overview, but certainly want to give any of our, my colleagues an opportunity to ask any questions specifically about the development. Board member Wright, any questions? Uh, yes, uh, this actually was, you brought this up uh, Chairman Hodge at the last meeting about mm -hmm. the affordable units. You had mentioned there was 1,300 residential units, and that's including the multifamily, correct? Yes. Correct. And you would look, you didn't know at that time the developers, if they were actually including affordable units in their plan. Were you able to talk to the developers of the multi units and other housing to see if they are planning on doing affordable units? You know, I've, I failed to do that, so I apologize for that. I did not, did not do that. Okay. But just a great question, and yes, I did bring that up. And if you could clarify for these multi-family developments, you have sold these parcels to another developer, so you are not developing those yourself. That's Is correct. that correct? Okay. Right. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah. So I understood that. It was just, you know, if you yeah. could find out, great. If not, you know, we can find out later. Yeah. Thank you, Board Member Wright. Anything else? Good. Okay. Board Member Forrester. Um, are we going to review Can you the hit your, can you hit your mic? Oh, it's on. Okay. I can't hear you. Yeah, bring it down. Yeah. Are we going to review the documents later? Yes. Okay. I'm fine then. Okay. Board Member Cordova. Okay. All right. 
All right. Well, we certainly appreciate you all coming before us. Uh, we'll we'll uh, we'll go specifically to the resolution today, um, but we thank you for for coming. So thank you for for coming again. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> so we we have now kind of gotten a, refreshed our memories and for others uh, gotten some more information on the cent overall Century Farms development. Uh, let's talk specifically about the documents. What I'd like to do is uh, let's call Jeff Odom up, if you will, Jeff. And, and Jeff, before you get started, let me, if, if the board will acquiesce, let me bring up a couple of key points that we discussed related to this bond issue. Um, and then I certainly will give you an opportunity to add anything that I may have missed or clarify and then give anyone else an opportunity to ask any questions. So what we're talking about today is issuance of bonds for infrastructure. Couple key points, and this goes back to some of the questions that, that we had at our last meeting. I, I just wanna make sure I address some of those. One, this central business improvement district was created in 2018. So this is not new, it's already created, it was created by the council. Um, as part of this, there's, a, there's an additional $1 per $100 of assessed value that specifically goes to the Central Business Improvement District. I wanna clarify because this is, a, this is certainly important for us to, to understand. This is not taking out any revenue from property taxes, uh, the normal property tax that goes to schools, police, et cetera, pay our Metro employees, pay our teachers. This is $1 above that amount per $100 per assessed value. There are some questions about can that number change? That number can only be changed if the property owners within the CBID agree to that number. Will that value go up? Well, right now, most of these properties are vacant land, so they're not developed, but as they're developed, their property values will rise, hence their assessed values will rise, so that $1 per 100 will increase, but the actual rate will stay at $1 unless uh, the property owners agree to that. In addition to that, this CBID is only for this development. It only applies to this development, and it's, it's something that is paid by property owners within the development. Jeff, thus far, am I, am I covering? Okay. <laughs> and then specifically as, as we talk yeah. about the, thank you, and then specifically as we talk about the infrastructure, we talked a little bit about this before. This is a little unique as well because the developers have already spent roughly about $35 million in doing the infrastructure. Typically this is, the bond is issued on the front end, but the developers have done a lot, of the, a lot of the work, there's only I think about four to five million dollars worth more of work that needs to be done. So from that standpoint, just big picture infrastructure wise, uh, very little risk there because a lot of it's already been done. A lot of this bond issuance will go to reimbursing the developer for costs that they've already spent um, in their cost sharing with Metro. And then lastly on that, there are a couple questions on uh, as far as how much money is in the in the balance now. That was one of the questions that came up. Uh, and there's currently $143,898.29 in the, in the cookie jar, let's say for now. And again, that's a lot because one, with these assessed $1 per $100, a lot of, these, a lot of this land is still vacant. But once it's developed, obviously that number will go up. And once the bond is paid back, any additional revenue from, the, from this CBID special assessment will go into that cookie jar to go to maintaining the infrastructure, the landscaping, et cetera, specifically for this development. Uh, and then the last point I'll just point out is that this area is very green, and so that's why there's so much infrastructure that needs to be done. And the infrastructure is only, this only covers infrastructure that benefits the public, so lights, uh, sewer lines, water lines, et cetera, all that good stuff. So I think those were the, um, the main things, and then, I'm sorry I said it lastly, but I, I did wanna bring this up as well. 
for what we're doing today, there's also no recourse to the Industrial Development Board. So in the event that for whatever reason, these projections or the money is not paid to the bondholders, there's no recourse to, to the Industrial Development Board for that. The bondholders will be paid strictly from the additional $1 per $100, correct? That's correct. Okay, outstanding. <clears throat> All right, so if you will, just introduce yourself again, just to make sure everybody knows who you're representing, and then anything I missed, feel free to cover, and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. Yeah, I, I'm Jeff Oldham. I'm a lawyer at Basbury and Sims, and, and I think I do a poor job of this frequently, and I think I did last month. I am, I am Metro's lawyer and your lawyer. Um, I think la last time we all sat up here together, and there may have been some confusion about whether I represented the developer or not. I represent you uh, and Metro, and so that's our role in this. Um, and, and we then had, you know, sort of the primary role of putting the resolution together and overseeing a lot of these documents that are before you today. So I'm happy to proceed. You know, everything the chair has said so far is spot on about the transaction. I'm happy to walk through the resolution and sort of give you a high level uh, overview of what it does. Uh, and then take questions, or, or I'm happy to take questions right now. Well, What's your preference? Why don't we do this? What, why don't we? Why don't you give us a high level okay. overview, just yeah. very high level, um, because we do, have, like I said, we do have a new board member today. And then I did want to just make sure I point this out as well. Certainly, this board is an independent body, but for you to come before us today, there was my, there were milestones that you needed to meet. Hence, council meeting last night. So a couple of things just to make sure that, that everyone is aware of. Number one, uh, the intergovernmental agreement that you needed, uh, that needed to be passed was approved by resolution last night at the Metro Council meeting. Uh, and it was also approved 11, 11 in favor, zero opposed in the budget and finance committee meeting right. on Monday. That's so right. that allowed you to be able to come before our board today. Yeah, that, okay. that's exactly right. And, and so as I go through this resolution, I'm gonna do a little bit of repeating of the history because I do think it's so important. The, as, as the chair has said, in 2018, the Metro Council created this district, levied the assessment with the sort of express stated purpose of getting this infrastructure done. And so that has been in the works. And as he said, the money's already starting to come in. Um, when you create a, a, a central business improvement district like this, there is also created with it a district management corporation, which is uh, a corporation that has as its board some developer-oriented folks, Metro Council folks, state representatives. And so that board has met and has approved everything um, that's in, in front of you today. And, and Jeff, can you, let's stay on that because yeah. that was another question that came up. Who are some of the people, if you have it there handy, that are part of this uh, DMD? Um, and I think, I was talking with Mark, I think they just had a meeting, I, I think, yeah, last let me, week. I've got, Sure. So, so the, the statute sort of dictates pretty much how these, these things are set up. And so you have two representatives of the, of the developer. And so uh, these two guys are two of the board members. You have three council and legislative folks. And so you have uh, Councilwoman Stiles. You have Jeff Yarbrough and Jason Potts from the state Senate and state house side. And then there are two neighborhood representatives, Susan Rice and George Johnston. So that's the, that is, that's the district management corporation. And their role is, is to approve and direct how the special assessment revenues get spent for the benefit of the district. That's, that's their job. And so as you described, you know, at the end, when all is said and done and the money starts going back to the cookie jar, they control the cookie jar. And they can't spend it on anything. It's only district stuff. Um, and it's, um, you know, the downtown, downtown has a seabed and it's, you know, streetscape maintenance and things like that. And so that's the role of the District Management Corporation. And, and so what's neat, this is, so there's community involvement because there's, you, you, you've got certainly elected officials, the local council representative, it makes sense makes sense for the developer, but certainly there's residents as well that are in the Definitely. community as well that are Definitely. part of this. Okay, yeah. thank you for, for sharing that. That was a question that came up at yeah. the last meeting, so thank you. Yeah, absolutely, and so so the council did their thing back in 2018, and then um, and then this year, the council's sort of, Metro's idea was, 
this really is, is a financing that's more properly undertaken by the Industrial Development Board because it really is sort of a project finance. It's the kind of thing that this board does. And so the Metro Council, by its action last night, approved an intergovernmental agreement that says we're giving, we Metro who would otherwise collect these special assessment revenues and give them to the District Management Corporation, we're gonna give them to you. And we want you to issue bonds to finance these initial infrastructure costs and use the special assessment revenues that we're giving you to pay the bonds. That's all the intergovernmental agreement does. And so, as you said, um, the Metro Council approved that last night. And so the council, to wrap all that up, created the thing, levied the assessment, and now has sort of approved moving the dollars to you uh, and asked that you, well, sort of in contemplation that you guys would then issue bonds to finance these infrastructure costs. So is that, I'm plowing a lot of the same ground you, sure. you did, but I, <clears throat> I just think it's important. And I guess the other thing I would repeat, not because you didn't do a good job with it. Sure. This does not involve property taxes or sales taxes. This is purely the, the over and above assessment. Nope, we, <clears throat> thank you for clarifying. That was, that was another question that came up. Well, thank you, Jeff. Let me, yeah. let's, do, let's do this then. Yeah. We appreciate you giving us that overview step up here. I'll start here to my left first with Board Member Davis. Are there any questions specifically related to the CBID or, or the bond issuance? Um, for thank Jeff. You, thank you, Chair. Mm -hmm. um, I, not much. Uh, very, very supportive of the project and, you know, really enjoyed the presentation last uh, month. Um, just a couple of things. Um, with uh, my one question, I guess, was, Funds go in, what's the actual mechanism? Is it at tax time that the dollar per $100 goes in? How, how is the actual mechanism of the collection? I can, I can answer that or I can, um, I mean the, it is on your tax bill. If you're in an improvement district, you have another line item at the bottom of your tax bill. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be that extra dollar per 100. And so it's collected all at the same time. And so then when the trustee gets the dollars in, they get split between taxes proper and special assessment. And the special assessment will be siphoned off and sent over to the bond trustee mm -hmm. to then pay debt service on bonds. Okay, and that is, it's sent through this board you're talking about though at that point, correct? <coughs> that's why they're functioning? That's right. Okay. And, and real quick, if I may, so I think that's a great point to on something else just to clarify. Again, this is only for property owners. So when you go buy a property, uh, you can look up what the property taxes are, at least at that time. That's right. So if you buy a property and it gets only the property owners, which uh, in this area, you know that before you buy, you, you can look that up and know, okay, you're going into a special assessment district where, okay, here's my property taxes. In addition to that, I'll be paying a $1 per every 100 of additional for the CBI did. So you know that, so okay. yeah. thank you. Um, yeah, the other question I just wanted to clarify, so, you mentioned the if it to ever change it from that one dollar for every hundred is it just you we we were saying all the property owners you know have to come together and decide does it then have to come back to council and, and or idb at that point as well it, it, it does and and the and the short answer is is you know once you issue bonds you'll see in the intergovernmental intergovernmental agreement the metro council's pledge this won't be any surprise to you they're not going to lower it while the bonds mm -hmm. are outstanding because the bondholders sure. are counting on it and so the only thing that's gonna happen between now and when the bonds are paid off is it, it increasing, and that requires a favorable vote of property owners and Metro Council approval. Uh, and us as well, or no, just Council? Not, not you. Okay. Um, I mean, you think, you know, from your perspective, the only impact to you would be as the bond issuer, you now have more dollars mm -hmm. flowing through. Sure. It really doesn't require your approval. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, and I guess that would be a scenario where, whoa, we don't have enough, we don't have as many tenants as we thought or something. For some reason, there wouldn't be enough revenue, I guess, is what they thought, and they would have to get a little bit more out of each business or something. Is that the idea? That, Why you would that, maybe have to raise that's it? A, that's a possible, yeah. That's Landscaper a, costs went up, and so we got to get a dollar twenty-five instead of a dollar. Or if the community just decided, look, collectively, we think it's worth it to pay a little more, mm -hmm. you know, every year in an assessment so that sure. we can, you know, and then list whatever whatever improvement. Yeah. But that would be down the road and really out of all of our hands. Gotcha. And certainly we, 
we, there's projections now, but but part of that will come into play once all this property is developed. There'll be a better uh, a better sense of what that number will look like based on the new assessed values after this land is fully developed as well. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah, the plot will get bigger as you say. But um, <clears throat> the only other uh, one other kind of macro question I'm wondering about is because um, I'm a fan of special assessments. I think this is this is a great way. You know, we hardly have any tools to raise revenue these days for anything. Um, and these uh, C-bids are- You're always are, in people's pockets, man. Uh, yeah, you know, these C-bids are pretty neat tools, all I'm saying, I guess. Um, did we have to get state authorization for this, or is this just something that we've had state authorization for C-bids, and this is only the second one we've done to downtown? It's, uh, it, yeah, it's a, so state, state statute authorizes the creation of C-bids, and I think there are three. I'm referring to Margaret here. She's the expert, but I think it's downtown Gulch. Oh, the Gulch. And South there. Nashville, mm -hmm. so this is the third. Okay. Gotcha. So did we just get state authorizations to do C bids wherever we want in Davidson County, or is it just each one we have you, to go to the state? You, you can do them wherever you want, and it's not just Davidson County. It's, that's, this is a statewide statute. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, that's just a tool we need to keep in mind. You know, um, there's lots of good tools. I know a lot of them, you end up siphoning the actual tax dollars uh, elsewhere, and so that gets unpopular quickly or, you know, very combative, but if it's just an extra special assessment in an area, you know, that's an interesting tool we can use for uh, different spots of town. But um, yeah, I'm, again, just reiterate, very supportive, um, appreciate all the clarification and um, look forward to seeing this project continue to develop. And I know it's a lot of bonds that we're issuing, but um, I think it's, um, this project has come a long way and it's the right thing to do. So. Thank you. And very quickly before I Give it over to my colleagues. Jeff, could you give, we obviously there are a lot of documents that we received. Can you yeah. give us a high level sure. about each document, maybe big picture, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to my colleagues for any questions. Yeah, so, so the resolution itself is about a full pager that sort of walks through the background that we've talked about, authorizes the issuance of the bonds, and then approves oh, six documents, um, an indenture, bond purchase agreement, offering memorandum, development agreement, and intergovernmental agreement. I'll sort of, and I'll walk through those. Um, the, the indenture is basically the contract between you and bondholders. Um, and, and it establishes the terms of the bonds. It pledges the special assessment revenues and your rights under the intergovernmental agreement to bondholders as security. Um, it establishes what we call sort of a waterfall, which means the special assessment revenues come in at the top and they spill down to pay debt service, fund debt service reserves, uh, and then go to the district management corporation so it establishes that waterfall. Uh, that's what the indenture does. The bond purchase agreement is the contract between you and the underwriter that is underwriting the bonds and getting them out um, into the public, which in this case is limited to accredited investors. This is not the... Um, you're not selling these to, you know, aunts and uncles in $5,000 increments. These are being sold to sophisticated investors because it is. It's a, it's a unique sort of credit. The offering memorandum is the document that, that is the prospectus for those investors that describes the project, describes the bonds, describes the projected revenue streams from the special assessment. The development and financing agreement is the agreement between this board, the district management corporation, and the developer. And the main provision in the development agreement is that they are committing to, fund, to do the last bit of four or five million dollars of work so that this thing is ready to go. Um, the intergovernmental agreement we've already talked about, that's the agreement between you and Metro where Metro moves the special assessment revenues to you and agrees to allow you to pledge them to secure payment of the bonds. Yep. Thank you. That's, thank you for that, yep. Jeff. And then one more item, if you could just briefly d touch on this. Um, we just got the, this report just came in this week, but um, <coughs> this should be on everyone's desk. This DTA report, right. can you speak to that just high level, um, what yeah. that says? And, and obviously this is something that this board had approved previously. Right. But if you can speak to that, it would be great. Yeah, also. so before I talk about DTA, let me tell you about, there's a, a company called Municap. Municap is sort of a nationally well thought of um, firm that is in the business of projecting revenue streams from special assessment deals like this. And so they go in and they, um, 
and they look at the development, they look at the surrounding area, they look at uh, comparable property values, they look at the development plan, and they build out a 30-year projection of what revenues are likely to be under various scenarios. In this case, MuniCap was engaged by the development team to prepare that and that, and that assessment report from MuniCap is gonna go in this limited offering memorandum and be used to help sell bonds. In our quarter collective view, Metro, us, um, Margaret's office, we all thought that it made a lot of sense for this board to have its own independent sort of review of that report <clears throat> to make sure so that you've got an opinion as to, you know, sort of as to its reasonableness. So the report you have now in front of you from DTA is DTA, which is also sort of a well thought of firm in this space saying, we've looked at that MuniCap report and it looks reasonable, it looks reasonable to us. So this is somebody you've hired, works for you. Independently. Independently. Mm -hmm to give you some comfort. Now we did not, and I'll say, you know, if you look at the back, there's some qualifications. We did not ask them to reinvent the wheel. And so they did not go and replicate the MuniCap report. That would have been really expensive, really time consuming. And so what they did is they, they reviewed the product that had already been done, but, but tested lots of things and are giving you this opinion that says that MuniCap um, report is, is reasonable. And that, that just gives us comfort um, you know, if you're going to go, if this board's going to go out with a limited offering memorandum with that MuniCap report in it, and MuniCap's been engaged by the developer, we just wanted to double check it. And so that's what this is. Does that make All sense? Right. Yes, okay. thank yeah. you for sharing. All right. Board Member Johnson, any questions or comments for Jeff related to this resolution? Yes, I have a okay, couple questions. Um, so after I left, I went and did my own research and realize that this isn't all it's, it sounds like. It sounds good on the front end, but on the back end, from my understanding, it seems like the city, the, the, the residents are pretty much footing the tax bill for it and the businesses. So I have a couple questions. One, in your assessment, did you evaluate how the growth of this area would, could, could potentially impact some of the smaller businesses that are surrounding the area? Two, when was the last community meeting you had? Because that area has changed drastically in the last year and a half. Um, so council, actually you said council man, but it's council woman, Dowell, um, has not been in that position for some years now. So I'm just wondering, have you had any open community meetings given COVID? And when you had the community meetings where the community members informed that part of their taxes would cover this assessment or did you just talk about the overall development and not talk about the bill? or who's gonna be paying for it. And then I have some more questions around the CBIG situation. Like it, it, it seems better than what we've been doing, but it doesn't seem like the best that we can do, like we can do better. Um, so that's the first set of questions, but I'll just go through them and you can ask or you can re-ask re me for clarification and I would like to hear it from you. Yeah, let's, um, let's start with the first question if that works on the community meetings. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah that, that's really, that's not, that, that's not my role. Let's I'm ask the developer to, yeah. to come back up. Yeah. There have been a number of community meetings over the last 12 months. They've all been Zoom. Uh, they've really been project specific community meetings. So when we'd have a, a Councilman Stiles would call a meeting when we had a project like the project we're selling to Oxford Properties, which is a mixed-use development of 22,000 feet of retail space and 311 apartments. And she publicizes those meetings and has them, and it gives people an open forum and an opportunity to speak. And we had lots of discussion before we got approval of the project. So we've had, I think, over the last year, two or three of those type of meetings. Again, they've been uh, subsets of the project. So. I mean, it's not the, on the overall project, it's but on a specific project within Century Farms. I think on the, uh, to, to answer one of your questions about the tax, the tax, and it, it's really an assessment, but the assessment only goes for, on people, residents in, or businesses within Century Farms. It doesn't go outside of the Century Farms residences or businesses. So each business that chooses to locate 
in Century Farms understands this assessment exists. So as part of our sales, you know, when, when we sell a piece of property or discuss with a developer buying a piece of property to develop an apartments or condominiums or that kind of thing, we make sure they understand this assessment. Now what they get for this assessment is the infrastructure that allows their business to come in and exist in this location. So it really is one of these deals, I think the chairman made, made mention of it, we're only assessing ourselves, we're not assessing anybody outside. We think this assessment positively impacts a much greater community within Antioch and within greater Southeast Nashville than it does just the Century Farms community. So in, in effect, the Century Farms people that are aware of the assessment and either purchase or develop or rent are aware of that assessment, but it benefits a far greater group of people. Yeah, and council member, to the point, council member Stiles, which is a great question, is part of the, the, the management, she's part of the panel on the DMC. So moving forward, once these bonds are, are paid, the local council representative is one of the people in addition to community members that will direct how that additional $1, how that will be diverted within the CBID after the bonds are repaid. That's correct, and she, she, we, we uh, communicate with Councilman Stiles regularly about businesses, small businesses and businesses she sees she wants to be in the community that she thinks are an important component. She called me yesterday and said, we need to make sure we have uh, businesses that appeal to people with small children. So uh, mm -hmm. we're working with a couple of businesses who want to kind of appeal to small children. She said that's an important component that's missing within the greater Antioch community. So. We have those kind of back and forth discussions all the time and we're sensitive to trying to attract businesses like that that will reflect what the community needs are. And back to the meetings we had before we even started Century Farms, the, the, the zoning we secured and the design we came up with reflected what we thought those, the community members told us they wanted. So we tried to be responsive to what the community wanted when we designed the project. Do you, Jeff, do you wanna come back up? So address yeah, those and I'm questions. asking these questions because I did my own research and I talked to about 50 people that live within a 15 mile radius of it and maybe only five of them were even aware that this was coming. So just want to put that out there. Um, my other questions are around like how the CBIG type of committee or whatever you call them is structured. Um, so one, once this, once the IDB votes on it and the council votes on it, does the CBIG CBID group of people have the authority to amend any boundaries without going back to the city for approval? Or do they have no. to come back to the council or is it just on them? No. So they don't have to come back, they can no, just- No, no, I'm sorry, they don't have the power to amend the boundaries. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing is, will those CBID meetings be like published? Will they be streamed on channel three? Like, will community members, how will community members be aware of what's going on? They'll be publicly noticed. So is that like a requirement or are you just saying in good faith? Margaret, what, do, do, you, do you know the, do you know what the other CBIDs do? Uh, no, I, I don't know, but I, if they are, if their meetings are public, but I would, I would think that they would be public meetings. It's a publicly created corporation. That's right. That's, that's the, my thing. Under the statute and under the uh, ordinance. And, I, and I'm happy to, that's a good question. I'm happy to reach out um, to Council Member Stiles and ask about that since she's on the DMC committee also and, and follow up. Um, we're, great question, we're not voting on that today because the CBIT is already approved. Um, but I will, I will partially follow up on that and, and follow up with the board. Um, I can ask her, no need to. The other question is, Will, like who will manage the enforcement of it like when everything is going on is that is that just up to the city council members to represent that area or how does that happen is there a representation from like metro legal or i'm just wondering are they able to just kind of do whatever they need without having to reference back to the board or to the city council yeah so the <clears throat> the cbit legislation any, any dollars that end up at the district management corporation which will be after these bonds are paid can be used for a, a list of specified purposes that are all basically related to either capital capital improvement, maintenance, or repair within the Central Business Improvement District. 
and the and that board gets to decide how to spend that money as long as it's on that list and nobody gets any i don't think the metro council gets any say so now the the cbid legislation does require the cbid to send a budget uh, each year to the metro council so maybe there is a little bit of oversight there but the real driving force behind those spending decisions is that district management corporation okay so they once we approve this that group of people are the people that we need to hold accountable so it, it goes out of the, our hands and it's on them i'm just trying to get clear that's right, but, uh, just be, be, be clear though this this that this entity and that district and these dollars were created in 2018 uh -huh. and that money's already there so I guess in my view, it's really more on the Metro Council. They, they, they created the entity. All, all this board's really doing is, is leveraging those dollars by borrowing money now to fund these upfront infrastructure costs. Is that a fair way to say it, Margaret? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I don't have any more questions for now, but if I think of something, I'll raise my hand. Thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for the question, Fort Member Johnson. All right, we'll go over here to the right. Board member Wright, any questions or comments specifically related to the resolution or about the bond issue? Uh, yes, uh, this is to the council, Jeff. I was, it, this assessment that we, were, that we had done, I was, I was comparing it to a, versus an audit versus review versus a compilation. And this assessment doesn't really give us any reassurance. Uh, they didn't dig into it, unlike an audit, really look into the project to see if it will really work. I understand we've only done, this is the third CBIT. So moving forward, is this gonna be a policy to get a review of the project? Uh, is restraint, the only reason why we did assessment, it was it time related, cost related? Because I would like to establish something a little more thorough moving forward. So are you talking about the MuniCap report or the DTA, the DTA. Re review? Yeah, yeah review. the DTA review. Um, I, th I think it was a it was a function of um, time cost. Um, yeah, you're, you're really asking: Are you going to get somebody to absolutely just replicate what had already been done? Uh, and and the decision was made not to do that, but instead okay. to to get a review, and that that sort of was the sweet spot here for for what we needed. But I, I certainly hear what you're saying. Right. Yeah, because we have a lot of information to you know. I, I got the documents. I yep. looked over everything, and of course having a second or third eye look at what is presented and giving, giving uh, thoughts and, you know, like with audit, just to make sure that, hey, what we're looking at, it will work and it's good. I mean, I love the project, so don't get me wrong, it's a great project, but since we're, if we're gonna spend money to do an assessment, let's get as much as we can. If it's within, you know, the, the dollar range is yep. something the, the board is willing to spend. Thank you. And just to add some comments there, Mark, uh, as we move forward with this body and look at our projects being bought to this body, we'll look at doing a fiscal impact analysis and economic impact analysis. We haven't done that before. Mm -hmm. We'll look at some true underwriting for these projects yeah. as we move forward, which is my background. And I think you and I talked about DMCs and MMDs from other states, which is Texas mm -hmm. and Tennessee are all very similar. So we'll look at a more robust package as far as we look at some of these projects going forward. Sounds great. <laughs> Thank you, Board Member Wright. Board Member Forster, any comments or questions? Um, yeah, I had a couple of things. Um, just to piggyback off of Mark's comment, um, can, can someone refresh my memory how much we paid DTA for this letter? I believe that uh, it was in the, well, one, I don't think they've been paid yet. I haven't seen an invoice come through. Um, but I believe that the agreement was in the, the $12,000 range. That, that was what I was thinking, yeah, $12,000. And, 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 and I believe it'll be paid for out of the cost of issuance of the bonds. You mean, so we won't be paying for it? The city won't be? It was originally uh, agreed that uh, the, the funds would come out of the account of the IDB because there are funds available, but that the cost we would, would go into the cost of issuance of the bonds, yes. Okay, so really the city is paying for the... The city is not paying for it. The, the bonds would pay for it. So once these bonds are issued, there's a line item uh, called 
cost of issuance and that pays for all of the professional services that go into the issuance of the bonds. Okay. And so this would be one of those line items. And so ultimately the revenues would pay for the, all of those professional services. Okay, so for reimburse then, basically. Yes. And uh, I was just a little confused by the first line that said um, the study has yet to be finalized. And, and that's, so, so as we go from here, uh, you know, the, the market is moving every, the, the interest rate market is moving every day and these bond, uh, and the bonds will be priced on a, on a date certain and the market will do what it, what it is. One of the provisions in the muni cap report that DTA was reviewing is a comparison of the revenue streams to debt service on the bonds. So it's in, not in any significant flux, but it's in flux because debt service is changing right up to the day, and that's why that's why they say that's that. That's what that's referring yeah. to. And we will get a final letter that that I suspect will look exactly like this. That will have that qualification out when that report and when that debt service is final. Okay. And uh, so the the muni cap report. I was just interested in it. Um, can you just very briefly? explain the different scenarios that they looked at it looked like there was three different scenarios yeah hold on i'll i'll, I'll pull it up here um they do um three scenarios one and this is sort of uh the you know for for the majority of the bonds the, the one that matters the most <clears throat> is is one that counts i'm trying to I'm just say this efficiently only counts revenues on projects that are in some form of contractual commitment now. So that's that's sort of a conservative thing. Things that, you know, there's no there's no letter of intent, no lease, no contract on, it, it ignored them. <clears throat> it counted only the ones that are under contract, and then it assumed that the va that the values, appraised values and assessed values grew at two percent a year. And the two percent, then that that sort of got reflected in reappraisal years. So then every fourth year, you'd see the sort of two percent a year catch up. That's the that's the primary uh, scenario. There's another scenario that is just like that one, but without the two percent inflation. And then there's a third scenario that assumes that the whole development is developed as planned, including not just stuff that's under contract. But everything that's contemplated. So kind of like a worst and a best scenario, and somewhere in the middle. Yes, that's right. And all work. So there, there are two. There are two series of bonds, senior lien bonds that are the vast majority of the bonds. <clears throat> They're sold based on that first, that first scenario, that bondholders are counting on. The revenues from things that are un under some form of written contract, letter of intent, uh, and the 2% growth per year. That's how those bonds w were sized. There is a subordinate series of bonds that is sized based on that third scenario, which is it all it all got done. And so that's that's how the bonds are structured. Okay, that was, thank you for that. Yeah. Um, but uh, that was my next question, mm -hmm. really, was looking at the different series of bonds. Mm -hmm. If you could just real briefly, I sure. mean, you know, it looked like the two other ones were capital appreciation bonds. How, how does that work? <clears throat> so maybe the first place to start is the sort of senior and the subordinate. Um, you know, the, the senior bonds are going to be sold to accredited investors through an underwriter. In, you know, anybody who meets that qualification, anybody and everybody under an offering memorandum. The market for those, the, you know, the way you go about selling those is you need to have some uh, elements of, of comfort. And the element of comfort there is twofold. It's the, I'm going to call it the more cons conservative assumption under the muni cap report that only counted properties that are sort of under contract. And then the, the bonds are sized such that that projected revenue stream is always at least 125% of debt service in a given year. On those bonds, the the subordinate bonds will actually be sold to the development team. They're sort of self self financed, 
the, those will be sized based on that scenario C that everything comes in. All bondholders bear the risk that special assessment revenues don't come in as projected. This board doesn't bear that risk. Metro doesn't bear that risk. It's not an event of default if they don't come in. That's just all you're saying to bondholders is we get, you, we get whatever sent to us, you get it, and that's all you get. And you gotta live with it, but you can take some comfort, senior bondholders, that we're only counting properties that are under contract and you've got this 25% cushion. That's, that's the senior and subordinate. Um, the difference between now, so there's two senior bonds. There's current interest bonds and capital appreciation bonds. Current interest bonds are bonds that you're probably familiar with. They're bonds that pay interest. Interest pays semi-annually. So if you bought a, a million dollar bond, I'm gonna get the math wrong here. A million dollar bond at 5%, you know, you would get, what is that, $50,000, yeah. $50,000 every six months, you know, or I'm sorry, every year, you would get paid $50,000 until that bond matures. That's a current interest bond. And that's what, when Metro issues GO bonds or water and sewer bonds, that's what they issue. Capital appreciation bonds are bonds that the interest accrues, but it doesn't pay. And it only pays at maturity. Mm -hmm. And so if you have, you know, let's go back to my example. If you have a, 20, a bond that matures in 2030, and it's a current interest bond, then in 22, 23, 24, you're paying 50, 50, 50, 50, and then the maturity. With a capital appreciation bond, the bond matures in 2030, and the interest is accruing, but there's no payment being made. And then you get to hear it, it all pays. The reason you do capital appreciation bonds is <clears throat> you, have a, you have a revenue stream like this one where that is gonna grow significantly over time because things develop. And that, and that revenue stream will support the payment of debt service here, but not here on the short end. And so that's why they're structured that way. And so you, you do as many cap, I'm sorry, current interest bonds as you can do, and you backfill with capital appreciation bonds. That's why it's set up this way. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. thank you. Good explanation. Man, I'm, I'm ready to change my major to finance now. <laughs> great, great questions, thank you. Very insightful. Board member Cordova, any questions or comments? Vice Chair Segal. I have a, a question. I, I think I know the answer to, but and maybe Margaret, you're maybe the one to answer this. Does anybody, or I don't know, I'll throw this out to anybody, but does anybody <laughs> know? We get the report, we issue the bonds, and then historically we've just kind of said, okay, it's out there, and we don't really pay attention to these things on a regular basis. Are there currently any metro offices that are tracking, say, are the values of the property improving as expected or any sort of reports that are required on any sort of ongoing basis for this? Or being made, even if not required? Um, this is the first deal that we've done like this. So uh, no, I don't believe so, but there are some continuing disclosure obligations under the, uh, the bond documents that we are required to meet, but those will be met by, um, we're, we're, we'll be hiring Municap yeah. to make sure that those, um, those obligations are met. Okay, but, and will those come before the board as they're yeah. made for yeah. us? Yeah, let me, it's a good question. It? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, the sort of back-end administration of this is, is important. Um, and, and here's, you know, sort of one thing that's going to happen is you're going to have the revenue collection piece of that. You won't see much of that except that you'll just, did the money come in or not, you know. Um, but it, um, uh, as Margaret said, we're going to have a continuing disclosure obligation every year. And that disclosure obligation is going to have a couple of things that I think will be a good summary report for this board. And it's going to be... Did the money come in? And if so, how much? How did it apply through that waterfall to pay debt service, build up reserves, to go to the district management corporation? And, and then we're gonna have to prepare a report that describes the development, um, sort of an assessment, an updated assessment report. Um, these documents build in $50,000 a year, um, which is, we think, I think more that's need. It's not, we don't, ha we don't have to use all 50. Um, but we've reserved $50,000 of capacity each year 
to engage a third party to prepare that report, and you'll and you'll get it. And so, I, I think it'll be a, I think it'll be a good thing. And just you know, time it in. You know, I would love to be involved in that report. Yeah. Having done these in other markets, where you look at tenancy to make sure that we want to finance a, a debt project in ten years and just take it. Make sure you maintain the occupancy both on the residential side and the business side. Look at job creation, how many people work in the various businesses there, but also look at the capacity of the attached collections and the fiscal impact of the project to make sure we're all aware of that. So let's work on that report together. Yeah, no, that's great. Yeah. yeah, and, and maybe it's something too, whether it's, you know, not every year or, or every two years, just come before us, let's talk <coughs> about it as a board to get an update on it. Um, to see how it's going to, to Courtney's point so we can look at the analysis and, and true impact, really return on investment on it, so. Yeah, yeah. I think one of the consistent comments I hear from council members and citizens is, well, I don't know how to analyze anything you're doing. And so to the extent that we can have all that information would be really great because then we can actually say, this is what's happening, this is what our return is. So as we move forward, we're going to build out a real eco plan for the city. As you know, the city does not have a strategy for economic development. We have a regional strategy, but not a localized strategy. We don't have a real office of economic development. So it's basically two of us managing a city of 700,000 people. So hopefully we have a real plan. Put that out there, huh? <laughs> we have a real plan and strategy to kind of shake this out. So we have those tools. We can look at a project and make sure that it's a real return. Yeah, really put, put that on the top line of your resume, managing it all. Yep. <laughs> Anything else? Yeah, that's all. all right. Well, I want to thank thank uh, my colleagues. Everyone had some phenomenal questions and comments today. So so thank you. Uh, with that, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the resolution approving the authorization issuance and sale of bonds for the subject project. All right. We have. Any, do we have a second? I'll second. All right, motion properly seconded. Any discussion? All right, we will now take a vote. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? All right, let the record show that, uh, Margaret, that I'm abstaining from the vote on this one. Thank you. Uh, Motion carried. So thank you all for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you for your time. Thank you to the board. All right, let's move on to old business. Item number, sub item number B, resolution approving the authorization issuance and sale of tax exempt bonds for Nashville leased housing associates. Three limited partnership, a Minnesota limited partnership for the development of a multifamily residential housing facility located at 900 Dickerson Pike. Nashville, Tennessee, commonly known as 900 at Cleveland Park and all matters related there too. Uh, quick, just refresh on this, and we have some new board members. This came before us back in the winter. Uh, we were meeting virtually at the time. Uh, this is on Dickerson Pike, uh, right there where Dickerson intersects Cleveland. Uh, if you're ever on Dickerson coming from Jefferson Street, it's kind of right after Dickerson kind of Tur turns, um, but certainly very close to, in close proximity to, to everything that's going on in River North. Uh, this a great area, I live in East Nashville, so Dickerson Pike is certainly changing and, and, uh, and growing, so certainly a need for these types of projects. And again, this board has been very intentional in supporting these types of projects uh, in our city. It's, it's something that uh, I know I care passionately about and a lot of other board members do too. So, um, and you all did do the other project further north on Dickerson Pike as well. Just a refresher, there's another project, Highland Ridge, that we uh, also talked about back in the winter, uh, further up on Dickerson past Brawley Parkway, that's next to Lowe's and Walmart, that's now open preserve at Highland Ridge. I wanna say that groundbreaking for that project was maybe 2018, several, myself and several board members went to that. Um, that's now open, uh, and if you all recall, on that project we had the council member for, for that project, council member Gamble, attend our meeting and talk about how the residents there and the community are very excited about that project that they completed. Um, and then at our meeting in January, we did have council member Parker 
uh, come and speak in support of this specific project at 900 Dickerson Pike. So I just want to say that, that, that you all have come before us in the past and, and uh, the community seems really excited about your other project, like I said, uh, further north on Dickerson. So anyway, just, just to give an idea of, of some background, refresh everyone's memory. If we have any representatives on this project, if you would, please come forward. We appreciate it. Introduce yourselves. Uh, please give us an update. Um, you know, A, just give us a few more details on the project. Again, we have a few new board members. Um, and, and I certainly would be interested in hearing why you chose that, chose this specific area, what attracted you, and, and, uh, and then we'll, we'll take any questions and get into the details of, the, of why you're here today. Thank you. Sure, thank you very much, Chairman and uh, board members for being here today. Uh, my name is Dylan Klopp. I represent Dominium, the developer on 900 Dickerson. As was mentioned just before, we developed uh, Preserve at Highland Ridge. We're happy to report that all 261 units are fully occupied and we are building out our waiting list. We're currently over 400 people. Uh, need for this, huh? Pardon? There's a great need for this, huh? Exactly, and so that kind of leads into your comment of why did we choose further down on Dickerson um, the 900 Dickerson Pike site. That there's clearly a need and that was a great opportunity. That site was available prior to the, uh, the Oracle uh, headquarters acquisition. Good thing you got the it then, right? Exactly, <laughs> sometimes it's good to be lucky. So, um, but uh, to, to speak to the 900 Dickerson Pike project, that is 100% affordable. Incomes are restricted to 60% of the area median income and rents would be 30% of that 60% AMI. Um, what that translates to in dollar amounts uh, for a family of four, that's roughly $50,000. So uh, we're very happy to be able to provide uh, 256. Can you, can you repeat those numbers again, just slower? So sure, make sure the 60% uh, area median income for a family of four would be roughly $50,000 in annual income. So we're serving people uh, that are you know, in need of, of reasonably priced, high quality housing, which is what we're in business to do. We've been in business for over 50 years and uh, have a commitment to long-term uh, owning, operating, and developing affordable housing across the country. Um, as I mentioned, there are 256 apartment homes uh, ranging from studios to three bedroom apartments. So studios ones, twos, and threes. The site amenities will include a dog park, bike storage, uh, storage lockers, uh, package, a package room for Amazon deliveries and such. There's a fitness center, a club room with a kitchen area. There's uh, workstations. Outdoor uh, amenities would include uh, courtyards. There's three of them, lounging areas. There's grill space. We have a rooftop uh, deck with a great view. Um, Inside the units, we're doing uh, energy efficient appliances, stainless steel appliances. There's washers and dryers in all the units uh, connected for high speed internet. As we know, over the past year, that's become very important for, for everyone. Um, our development partners include Smith P Studio. They worked on our preserve at Highland Ridge project up the road. Uh, have a great time working with them. We are in the process of picking a contractor. Uh, one of those contractors is Hardaway Construction. They built our Preserve at Highland Ridge site. So we're happy to be you know, working with them on this front end. Our financing partners, they are near identical. Uh, well, this is a near identical structure to uh, the Preserve at Highland Ridge development. Our financing partners would include the uh, bond issuer, the IBD here. Uh, the construction tax credit equity bridge lender is JP Morgan Chase. The um, pilot bond underwriter is Collier's Securities. The uh, low income housing tax credit investor is Polaris Capital. And the Freddie Mac originator and servicer is uh, Greystone Corporation. And that would be the permanent mortgage if I didn't mention that. Um, we were allocated $43 million in bonds and those bonds are set to expire at the end of November. We are targeting a close and are ready to, uh, you know, working towards being ready to close uh, just before Thanksgiving to try and give everyone something to be thankful for. <laughs> so that, that is all I have if available for questions. And when you say close on the bonds, correct. just and to clarify. Correct, close on the bonds, exactly. And, and, and begin 
construction shortly thereafter. Yeah, so so that was my question. So what are you looking at timeline, uh, assuming that that time frame works and you're able to complete that in November, when do you anticipate uh, construction and what's your, what's your timeline on start of construction and then completion and are you doing this project in phases? Sure, so this is one building we're uh, going from start to finish. Um, if we close before Thanksgiving, which we will do, uh, we would probably start construction by December 1. The construction phase would last 27 months and that would take us to uh, you know complete building uh, in the first quarter of 2024. And at that point, we'd be open for leasing. And how many total units again? 256 homes. That's pretty close to Preserve It Highland Ridge. Correct, Preserve It Highland Ridge is uh, 261 across eight buildings. So slightly different uh, structure. All right, well, thank you. Well, before we get to the, to the specific bond issuance, I'll start here to my left. Are there any questions in general about the development? Um, yeah, just a couple, um, and really appreciate the affordable housing developments. Um, mm -hmm. Just, just kind of curious, um, a couple things about the one. Like, how did you guys pull off like an entire building at sixty percent AMI? Is it, is it, is it a lot? I, you listed off a lot of, you know, obviously bonds, and then is it, is there a THDA or that sort of thing? Correct. THDA uh, is issuing tax credits. For the okay. uh, low-income housing tax credits, which we then sell to an investor. Okay, so that's the predominant reason that you're able to, you know, sort of make the numbers work on your performer. Okay. Correct. Yep. Is it maybe too because you got the land at a decent price before or uh, was announced? Exactly. Yeah, that too helps. So um, again, cool. sometimes good to be lucky. But yeah, the, those tax credits are are key. Um, sure. Yeah, just because you know you don't hear a lot of projects um, that are entirely sixty percent. You know, obviously there's a lot of uh, developers trying to do affordable housing, it's difficult. Um, we certainly need more 30% and lower AMI, which is sort of your, it seems like only MDHA and people like that can pull that off. Um, but uh, I mean, to get a 60% AMI project is, with that many units is like extremely needed. So, um, you know, obviously I think we should be very supportive, but uh, it certainly let's answer all the questions and figure out, you know, make sure this is a good deal for us. Mm -hmm. But uh, just just in general for the project, I mean, it's just so rare to get 60% um, AMI for that many units, so thanks. Thank you, Board Member Johnson. Any questions or comments related to the specific development before we get into the bond? Yeah, 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 I got you. I have a question about where this is. I'm trying to visualize it. I was looking at the map and I don't. Sure, so along Dickerson Pike and then the crossroad would be Cleveland Street, which will eventually become the connector uh, under the freeway there over to the River North uh -huh. um, uh, development What's right area. there now? Is that like, Pardon? What's right there now? Is that where the it, air store is? It, well, I guess would be a parking lot, but yeah. it's not. I think there's a gas station across the street. Uh, yep. This is on the southern side of Dickerson, closer towards downtown. Correct. Thank you. I'll, if I have any more questions, I'll raise my hand. All right, thank you both. Go here, board member Wright, any questions or comments? Uh, yeah, I want to commend you on the project as well. Uh, I'm very familiar since I run a nonprofit and do affordable housing. And doing that many units at 60%, because that's what we target, 60% and below. That's, that's really, really good. So I'm with board member Johnson on that one. Uh, since it's a light tax project, what is the uh, years on the affordability? Make sure the covenants. Sure, so the initial compliance period would be 15 years. 15. And the extended use would go out to 30. Up to 30, okay. Awesome. Yep, keep it going. That's our <laughs> commitment to affordable housing. All righty. <laughs> All right, B thank you. Board Member Forrester. Um, I believe it's just south of Sugar High Restaurant. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I, I'm just curious, um, I have heard that uh, projects that are affordable housing get the permits expedited. Have you found that to be true in this case? It is faster than what we experienced on Preserved Highland Ridge. So that has been very helpful. That was the, uh, the mayor had, uh, had kind of put out that proposal. However, there hasn't really been um, 
from my understanding, from what I've seen, uh, a process for each department to be able to, to go to. Uh, what we've been doing is presenting the letter uh, and then evidence that the project is affordable. Um, so it's moving faster, but it's um, occasionally we have some uh, stickiness in some departments. But still overall, it's been very tweaks. helpful. <laughs> Pardon? Still needs a few tweaks. Sure, yeah, and I think this is relatively new and we're, you know, one of the, you know, newer projects to come before in this in this process. And I believe that this will be uh, ironed out as more projects come through. Yeah, so that's a, we're okay. very happy to have that, um, you know, the, the energy and effort put behind that. So I mean, it's a, a great piece of land so oh. close to downtown. I was just curious because since it is directly bordering, I guess it's going to be a tunnel going underneath the interstate. Does that affect y'all in any way? I mean, do you have to cooperate been, with the state of Tennessee? And yep, we've been in communication, constant communication, and uh, and really just kind of you know here's what we're proposing, and let's make sure this works together with you guys. Um, as far as right now, there's been no impact and there's projected to be no impact. There's still some more land leading back that way. So I think that will probably impact those folks more than us mm -hmm. at this time. I, I do really appreciate what y'all are doing. I know there was some cost overruns on Highland Ridge and you guys had to come back to us. Have you done your due diligence on the, on the land this time? Yes, yes, uh, you're very much correct. Also compounding, uh, a compounding issue to that was during COVID, there was a shortage in uh, materials across the board. And so we experienced a lot of headaches in that realm. Um, we've, throughout this entire process, have been going back to our contractors, which is why we were bidding with two, um, is to make sure that we're getting the most accurate pricing. We've gone back three or four times to get updated numbers in real time. And we are very confident that we have everything figured out. We've done all the environmental uh, inspections, everything. So we're very confident that we're in a much better position than, than what we had on uh, Preserve at Highland Ridge, yes. Okay, and just one more question. Um, so when do you expect to be taking application for this, uh, for people, for residents? Sure, so uh, we will open up in the first quarter of 2024. However, as we get closer to, to that date, we will begin taking applications. So I'd imagine our uh, management company, which we own and have control over, uh, they would be taking applications, I'd imagine roughly six months, they'd start marketing kind of what we have to offer. So, um, and it would certainly be taking the people who are trying to move in at Preserve at Highland Ridge down the road and sending them our way as well. So. Uh, to 900. Great, thank you so much. Of course, thank yeah, you. Yeah, great sure. questions. And just to speak on that too, in, in case, because, you know, working in real estate as well, I mean, until you start, there are issues that come up, unfortunately, uh, unforeseen issues. And so I think to point out too, to Board Member Forrester's comment about Preserve at Highland Ridge, a little bit different from the standpoint, obviously this property is a lot flatter as well. Um, the Preserve at Highland Ridge is, is sub substantial topography changes as well. Uh, that certainly added to some unforeseen cost. And, and to my recollection, I think you all had you all had done, without getting all the details, you all had done some geotech work preliminarily, but when you do that, you're, you're checking spots. You're not checking the whole property. You're doing borings in. Unfortunately, you ran into some unforeseen issues, but this property, one, it's a lot flatter and smaller, quite frankly, too. So uh, less chance, but if something happens, then you can come, certainly you come before us and this board can decide how to move forward. So uh, that's great. Great questions, Board Member Forster. Board Member Cordova, questions or comments? Yeah, I just want to echo everybody by saying this sounds like a great project. Um, one question I do have is, what's the impact going to be on the existing infrastructure there? And are you guys committed to um, building out that infrastructure? As well as, I know there's a bus stop right in front of there. Um, so how would that impact sort of the residents that live there and utilize those services um, when you're doing this sort of project? Sure. So this site is is currently vacant, and a lot of the surrounding uh, retail is surrounding properties are retail or warehouse type structures. Um, the bus stop that you uh, mentioned, we've been in contact, and they basically came back to us and said, "Let's see what it looks like when you're you know you started moving dirt." Um, so our plan, in my mind, is going to be just moving the bus stop across the street, uh, the other side of Cleveland Street. So there shouldn't be any impact to 
you know, ridership or, or the ability to access the, uh, the bus stops. In terms of uh, traffic impact in the immediate area, we have done a uh, traffic study, traffic impact analysis. We've been in communication with the city and uh, we've been going through that entire process as well. Got it, so you're envisioning that the uh, sidewalk as well will be closed through that whole thing while you move the bus stop across the street and- the Correct, for road. safety purposes, it would make the most sense to- uh, uh, Got you, no uh, scaffolding or anything like that. Correct. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Vice Chair Segal. Yeah, so again, I mean, this sounds like a really great project. I think one of the things that's nice about the fact that this is a tax credit property is that my understanding is that you're gonna have ongoing obligations to the federal government to maintain this property in accordance with those standards. Can y'all talk about those inspections and those standards a little bit? Because I think it's a nice benefit for us to know how closely this is watched over time. Sure, so every applicant has to prove income. And so not only is that done in the application process, it's done as, when they move in and then, you know, verified again, you know, a year later uh, and, and for the entirety of the pro project's existence uh, for the affordability compliance period that we had mentioned before, 15 years and another uh, 15 to total 30. And so, um, yeah, that it, it, annually we have to be able to report the uh, the fact that the project is 100% affordable and that everyone is earning uh, upon moving in 60% or less of the area's median income. And our incomes or our rent that we charge is also dictated and has to be kept at the, at the level of 30% of 60% area median income. Yeah, and I think my question also goes to the physical maintenance of the property. So what sort of obligations are y'all gonna have over time to, to physically maintain the property in accordance with how it's built and those standards? Yep, so we have to meet all uh, building code requirements. We have um, uh, uh, ADA accessibility requirements and those are inspected. Uh, and that is started on the front end and maintained all the way through for the 15 years. So. Uh, you're 100% right, it's not only city codes, but then also the, the federal requirements that exist over our heads as well. Um, and, and again, that is for the- and Dylan, let me add, um, my name's Frank Hogan, I'm an investment banker with uh, Collier Securities. I think to, to that question as well, there'll also be requirements um, and responsibilities to the lender uh, to maintain the project as well. Uh, but having said that, I, you mentioned earlier that you know Dominion has a very long-term view of ownership and management of their assets and uh, you're gonna be a part of the community for 15 years and, and well beyond that. Exactly. All right, thank you, Vice Chair Segal. So two quick questions for me. One, and I'll let you answer this one first before I get to my last question. One, um, I know I like Dickerson Pike, I live in East Nashville, so I'm very familiar with the area, but even before the Oracle deal was announced, obviously you were looking at Dickerson Road. You did preserve at Highland Ridge. Um, you had this one. What, what really attracted you to this property and, and why did you think it would be a, 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 key, a, a great location for, for affordable to, to do this type of project? Sure. Um, Connectivity. There's a bus route right on there. Sure. Um, employers are, you know, surrounding the area, uh, close to downtown. There's a lot of good reasons in that respect. Um, land affordability at the time, you know, Oracle wasn't in there. Uh, prices in Nashville have gone through the roof. Uh, it's becoming increasingly difficult to find locations that are, you know, not priced out of our range, being that 100% affordable. Um, and so it really was just an opportunity to, um, you know, kind of create an urban affordable housing development that the area lacked, frankly. Um, and again, of high quality. This is a, indistinguishable from a, you know, market rate type uh, product in, in the marketplace for renting. And I'll agree, your, the preserver at Highland Ridge development looks, looks awesome. Um, so let me go here. Here's a loaded question for you. Okay. So, what you told us today, quite frankly, when I thought about this, I really thought about 
the backlog of affordable housing that we already have currently. And I thought about, this is a phenomenal project. You're bringing on, you know, over 250 units. You're not bring, but you know, you've got to get the land, go through your due diligence, all of that, and then actually start construction and then go through the construction progress. Bar barring anything unforeseen, we're looking at two years, over two years from now that these units will be available. By that point, how many more affordable housing units will we need? So obviously you know what you, your company knows what you're, this is what you do. You do affordable housing development, you do it all over the country. Based on what you're seeing in Nashville, uh, to your point, the difficulty of finding land, prices are continuing to rise, which make these types of projects harder. And maybe you wouldn't have been able to do this type of project had you tried to buy this land today, just due to the cost. What do you think that we need to be doing as a city from, from a developer's perspective to try to tackle this affordable housing, quite frankly, crisis that we have? Sure. That, you, didn't, uh, you didn't plan on that one today. I, I did not, no. I. Um you know, just identifying sites, that's, you know, number one, we're always looking for opportunities and you guys have a great idea where where more affordable housing is needed. So communication on that front. Um, you know, for support in meetings like this, uh, that's always helpful. If you're able to put dollars behind that, I don't, I'm not familiar with all the types of opportunities that you guys would be able to take advantage of, but I mean, Ultimately, it comes down to cost. As land prices keep going up, uh, you know, our incomes are capped that we could charge to be able to, you know, size out debt or generate a low income housing tax credit. So, you know, the cost to demolish a blighted site or to, uh, for soil remediation for the unforeseen uh, problems that we had at Preserve at Highland Ridge, anything in that kind of space at a local level, I think that would be helpful. There are some other things at the state level um, that obviously goes beyond your question, but um, that could change and make it easier for us uh, in, in a couple of spaces. But from a local level, that's what I see as, as an opportunity to help support affordable housing in your, in your communities, so. Outstanding, well, well I, appreciate, I appreciate that. And, and I would say this is, I guess a little foreshadowing that we'll, we'll probably be reaching out to you and maybe have you all come back and just talk to our group about what you're seeing and, and kind of going in depth on those recommendations as, as we look to um, do everything we can on that the economic development, affordable housing, quite frankly, uh, needs to be a comprehensive plan strategy go hand in hand together. So thank you for that. All right. so. We, we have now understanding of the project, refresher on that, and, and I will add to before I forget, council member Sean Parker uh, was unable to attend the meeting today, but again, he did attend this meeting. It was either in January or February, um, virtually, and give his support for the project at that time, and, and uh, we corresponded yesterday, and he said he would not be able to make it, but he did want me to share that he's, still a huge supporter of the project and um, is is very excited for that and, and so are his uh, constituents and residents. So I, I did wanna make sure I share that with, with the board today. All right, so let's talk high level about the bond documents. Do, do, do you wanna speak to that? And then Bob, if there's anything else that we need to add, I'll defer to you if there's any questions or anything that's missed on that. Sure, Bob, do you want me to take a, uh, take a stab at it? Sure. Okay, okay. Uh, well, the, um, uh, you're being asked to consider a resolution that would authorize the issuance of up to $43 million in tax-exempt bonds. Uh, the $43 million will bro be broken into two series, a $39.47 million senior obligation, which will be um, initially uh, funded by a tax-exempt construction lender, uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, uh, and then a three point uh, five three million dollar uh, bond issue that will be secured by uh, the pilot agreement uh, that is in place as well. Uh, the resolution will authorize the uh, uh, 
execution of, of various documents associated with, uh, with the tax exempt bond is issuance uh, regarding the senior obligations. There'll be a funding loan agreement uh, and a project loan agreement. Uh, on the, uh, the, the pilot bonds, there'll be an indenture of trust, a loan agreement, uh, as well as a bond purchase agreement and official statement. Uh, in addition, there's a tax uh, regulatory agreement and land use restriction agreement that, uh, that is executed by parties as well. Um, with that, I think the other thing to mention is that because the uh, both senior obligations and pilot bonds are, are, are you know, they're issued by, uh, by the uh, Industrial Development Board as a conduit bond issue, uh, there is, is you know, they're supported so the bonds are supported solely by the revenues on the project. There's no obligation uh, of the IDB uh, to make any payments uh, whatsoever uh, related to the bonds. So the purchasers of the bonds are, are going to look to uh, Dominium to, to, make, uh, to make those mortgage payments going forward. All right, Bob, is there anything else to add to that? I would just like to add that there are about 18 or so professionals involved in this project with all kinds of descriptions, lawyers, financiers, developers, et cetera, and they have been having weekly telephone meetings. Uh, everybody's been on them. Uh, so what, what we have here is a bunch of professionals that have worked very, very hard to make sure that this works from a standpoint, from whatever the, the standpoint is. And I've been on every one of those calls and am very impressed with the professionalism, uh, with the effort, with the due diligence, and it's continuing. And um, expect it to continue. And it, it's at a set time, you, you know, we're all used to that now. Got to call in the number and put in your passcode, uh, but, but it's useful. I just wanted you all to know that, that, that uh, the multiple, very, very good conversation here today about the multiple interests uh, that have to be involved in order for this to work. And, you know, I'm just saying that from a professional perspective, they're doing this very well. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you both. All right, with that said, I would like to entertain a motion to approve the resolution approving the authorization, um, issuance and sale of bonds for the subject property. All right, we- I'll go make the motion. You already made a motion. Vice Chair Segal made a motion. I did, okay, well, I'll second it. All right, okay. properly seconded. Is there any discussion? All right, we will now take a vote. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right. Any opposed? Aye. Thank you. Any opposed? All right. Motion. Motion approved and carried. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Plan to come back soon with with uh, detailed answers to that last question. Yeah. All right. Thank you all. All right. Now I thank everybody for their patience. Now into new business. HCA-ITNS request to terminate the pilot agreement and allow HCA-ITNS to exercise its purchase option and obtain full ownership of the real and personal property previously transferred to the IDB pursuant to the pilot agreement. Um, and, and we don't need, necessarily need to spend a whole lot of time on this. Again, this is only for informational purposes in the spirit of transparency. Uh, essentially, this was a pilot agreement that was approved prior to any, anyone on the current board's uh, service. And uh, I wanna say this was in 2011, 2012, and essentially how these pilot agreements are done is the IDB has to be the official, uh, due to state law, the IDB, the, us the Industrial Development Board, has to be the owner of the property during this pilot agreement period. That pilot has now expired, um, and so there's actually uh, language in the agreement when the pilot agreement was done that after the pilot agreement expires that the IDB will relinquish its ownership of the property. And this is pertaining to the HCA site on Charlotte uh, in Capitol View. Several of us, I don't know if anyone here, aside from me, 
gosh, I'm getting old. I, I think I was the only person that attended a meeting there several years ago, but that, that's what we're doing today. Again, there's no vote needed from the board, uh, but because I do have to sign the document, again, just for in the spirit of transparency, I just want to uh, share that with you. Uh, so anyway, this is something that we're required to do based on the agreement. Bob or Margaret, did I, if there's anything I missed on, on explaining that, let me know. I think you covered it quite well. Thank you very much. I, I agree with that. And um, uh, we have as a special guest today, just so you'll know, Tom Trent. Uh-oh, uh, <laughs> the legend. <laughs> and now don't make his ego go too big. <laughs> but Griffin Capital has a, a virtually identical circumstance going on where a pilot agreement is, is expiring. And when that happens, the title has to be moved from the IDB uh, and back into the normal title ownership on the expiration of a pilot. So um, there's also an opportunity uh, to get our able chair here to sign documents for the transfer of that pilot interest as well. And Mr. Trent has brought all of the documents and, um, and made them precisely correct. And so unless someone on the board objects, um, our chair will also execute those documents. Yep, all right, that's good. Now, I'm not, I like Tom, but I'm not signing anything unless Margaret gives me the green light, so. We'll, we'll make sure that's okay. Good. <laughs> well, thank you all again. Nothing the, the board needs to vote on, but again, just in the spirit of, of transparency, um, just want to make sure that, that we made everybody aware. All right, from a time standpoint, we are about a quarter to 12, so I will <clears throat> try to move through the, the next items. Just a couple items I want to run through uh, in this last section, Chairman's report. Uh, number one, meeting time. Um, obviously, over the past year and a half, uh, before I became chair, we kind of met at various times and we we're having to meet virtually. Um, since I became chair, one of the things I want to focus on is having a set meeting time. So that's good for us as board members to know when we're meeting, uh, but certainly to reserve this building as well so that um, parking is certainly much better here than it is at uh, Metro Public Square. Um, but certainly have a larger room due to what everything that's going on so we can kind of space out more and certainly if we as we have more guests plenty of room for people to space out so I just want to make sure as we have a couple of new board members does this time and date still work for everyone for meeting yeah works to me okay so here's here's what we'll do then we'll we'll go ahead a joy if you will go ahead and Let's plan to book this this room. We have this room booked through the end of the year. Let's go ahead and book this for 2022 as well. Um, so this will continue to be our main meeting location, certainly depending on how, how everything proceeds and, and hopefully the world continues to get better. Uh, we want, certainly wanna look at doing some things that I've been fortunate to on my board and, and have meetings at some of uh, these companies. And, and certainly we've talked about um, the African American Museum um, potentially have a meeting there next year. So hopefully, if the if the world is great, we can do some of that. Um, I've attended a meeting at Bridgestone HCA, but this again, barring some some changes, this will be the main meeting spot as long as we can get it booked. So, uh, Joy, just let me know. I'll follow up with you uh, tomorrow, and let's just get that book. So thank you, thank you all for your help on that. Very quickly too, just some exciting news. Uh, last week, I was able to attend the River North groundbreaking. Again, that is not the Oracle deal, but it's it's uh, adjacent and it's right next to, right behind Top Golf. So that was also um, really exciting and neat. And, and at some point we'll, pro even though that project is not part of the IDB, we will likely have the developers come and just speak to us about it just because I think it's really neat and it's certainly connected to the Oracle project as well. So I just want to share that. Uh, third quick item, affordable housing. Um, that is something that, uh, unless I'm reading the tea leaves wrong, is something that's extremely important to this board. Um, we just talked about Nashville is growing, which is great, but challenges for that are, are, are cost of housing. So 
And, and Courtney, I want to actually commend you very quickly. I, I was watching you from when you went before the council back in May um, and on, on Metro Nashville YouTube TV, and, and you were talking about a comprehensive strategy with working on development, but also ensuring that residents in affordable, I think it was in Dallas, um, uh, make sure that residents in affordable housing development you worked with, I think it was Home Depot to ensure that some of those jobs went to those residents. So I thought I was really impressed with that and what you said on that strategy. So um, I saw that say, I think here what, what I like to do and continue to work with Courtney on too is looking at ways that we can continue to use any, any resource that we have to improve affordable housing and um, looking at down the line, having a meeting devoted to that. Um, so, um, yeah, so I, I encourage you yep. as we kind of move forward with a sure. strategy for economic development, but also a housing strategy to really engage with our housing partners, such as Troy White from MDHA, to mm -hmm. make sure that we have this robust and all inclusive strategy for both yep. economic development and for housing, not just affordable housing, because I think <laughs> people say it's affordable housing, what that doesn't pertain to me. Housing pertains to everyone. So yep. let's make be clear about that. And we need to create a strategy for the city. We don't have a real robust strategy for the city or metropolitan area. So Yeah, and that's so why I said I was really impressed with what you said about that back in May. So um, anyway, I just want to let the board know about that. And then certainly Depending here on, on what comes before us, we're looking at doing, working with Courtney on putting together an, basically an economic ECD 101, uh, you know, s summary on what the board does, what are the tools and resources we have at our disposal. We have done that in the past. We have not done that here in the last two years. And certainly with us having several new board members, this is uh, certainly an opportunity to do that. And as part of that, I will probably ask one of our board members to talk about the Do Better Bill as well as part of that as well. Um, he's done it before, so. So we'll think, talk about, you know. I we'll think be, he'll be okay. We'll do ED one-on-one, but also talk about best practices from other cities, what other boards like this would do, both from levying fees for incentives and programs, but also looking at a more robust workforce and small business strategy, which if you're doing this body, in other bodies comparable around the country, they have a more robust platform. So we should really look at ways to look at workforce development, small business development, business attraction and retention and expansion. Where are policies to utilize bonds to do, you know, nonprofit developments or affordable housing or housing in general? So those are the things we'll look at. Those are things I'll bring before this body to be more robust and more inclusive. Absolutely. And and I guess what if you've been on the board for a few years, um, or if you're new, what's exciting, these are exciting times for all of us to serve, and so we'll continue to look at, turn over every rock and uncover any, any resource that we can to make a positive difference. And then very quickly, I, I do, as chair, wanna make sure while I'm addressing feedback, there are some questions and comments. I know several of our board members are not here today around transparency and documents, et cetera. And, and I do wanna say that, that we are currently working uh, to improve the process to to share all the documents to make them available uh, more easily and accessible to everyone in the public. Uh, part of that includes doing our due diligence from a legal perspective. There are some state laws that could uh, prevent us from sharing some documents. So we wanna make sure we, we follow our due diligence in, in that. And I have Margaret, uh, I've asked Margaret to work on that. And then certainly part of it is a technology piece as well with Metro. So we're actively working on that. Uh, so I do wanna make sure we're addressing that. One of the items I've asked Courtney to do, if you went on the Industrial Development Board website on nashville.gov, what we did do uh, for this meeting, which is new, uh, the detailed agenda that you all received is actually on Metro's website. So, even, so it's not just a basic agenda that's got the items, it's actually got a summary. So that's one of the things that, we've, that I've asked Courtney to do in the interim. Um, as a short-term solution to just try to make everything more accessible, but we'll continue to work on that and also work to make the documents easier for the board members as well. I do wanna remind people a couple of things that we also have in our disposal. If, if residents or friends or neighbors ask you about it, is number one, now that we have a set meeting time, certainly if people feel comfortable, you can encourage them to come here. Parking is better here. We have a larger space if people feel comfortable spacing out and we have a set time. It's 10 a.m. the third Wednesdays of the month. So that's one option. 
The second option you can run, remind people if they're unable to come, which certainly people can, it's 10 o'clock, it's during the work day, is that these meetings are posted on the Metro Nashville YouTube page. So for anyone who can't come that you know but wants to know what's going on, they can watch the whole meeting in its entirety. Uh, so that's another item that you can share with people. They, you know, and like me, I told my mom I was on TV, so she was excited. So, <laughs> yeah, we're, we're good, we're finishing up. And then one more item, um, this is very difficult for me to share, but it's, it, it was uh, made public last night at the council meeting. Uh, my dear friend, Margaret Darby, who I will say has been a friend to me, fellow East Nashvilleian, um, but I've, I've enjoyed working with Margaret. She's been extremely supportive and helpful for me during my time just recently being chair and certainly um, in the transition period when before, he came, before Courtney came in, there was not really an official um, director of economic development. Margaret really stepped in. Um, I, I spent so many hours talking with Margaret. Um, if she was in private practice like Tom Trent, I, I can't imagine what my bill would be. But um, she's been very helpful, so I, I'm saddened but excited for her. Uh, Margaret will be transitioning um, over to being the lead counsel for the Metro Council. Is, is that the right title? Um, starting in January, and I'll let you add anything that I may have missed on that. Oh, well, you asked me a question, so I thought I would answer. It's a special counsel for the uh, Metropolitan Council. Special counsel. Yes. Um, so you will be transitioning into that role uh, probably in January. January is the timeline, assuming that all of the approvals uh, by the council go forward and are, um, you know, positive. <laughs> Well, well, as a person, I'm certainly saddened, but excited for you and the opportunity for you. But um, I'm sure like uh, what I said, I'm sure a lot of the board members share. So it's just been a pleasure um, working with you and getting to know you over the last several years. And um, I'll certainly make sure that I wear you out with uh, <laughs> questions over the next two and a half months. So anyway, I, I did want to share that, but congratulate you as well. So, so thank you. Well, so congratulations to you for the opportunity thank and thank you. you for your dedication and in service during, you know, really with COVID and everything is a tough time. So we appreciate all your efforts. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Lastly, and we're getting close here to finishing up. Margaret Walker with Metro Finance is here to tell us about the board's financial position. There we go. All right, that's pretty close to what it was last month. All right, there there we go. I'm gonna shake down who spent, that's not me, I didn't spend that. I have to figure that out. Well, anyway, this, this concludes today's agenda. I'd like to thank again the members of the board for, for dedication, your time today, your phenomenal questions and comments, thank you. I'd like to thank Metro Finance, Metro Legal, and certainly all of the attendees today and developers that came and answered our questions. Uh, with there being no other business, I would like to entertain a motion to adjourn. All right, so move, do we have a second? All right, properly second, all those in favor? Aye. Oh, good, all right, motion adjourn. motion carried. Thank you, I have a wonderful day. While you're all still sitting here, I wanna say that when you're a professional, when you're a lawyer, you get to work with lots of different kinds of lawyers and I have never worked with a lawyer more cooperative, harder working, or informed on the subject matter she had to be informed about than Margaret Darby. And always ready to stand up. And always ready also to say stop. And, uh, and some of us know that sometimes that's the most important thing to know how to say. So thank you personally, if I may, uh, Margaret. And best of wishes in uh, your next step. Thank you. Get your questions in now. This has been a service of the Metro Nashville Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, 
or for more information about this and other programs, visit nashville.org.